Thank you. Good afternoon. A few years ago, another professor and I led a group of students on a remarkable adventure. We explored a slot canyon in the Blue Mountains of Australia, teeming with vegetation and relatively untouched by humans. The only way out at the end of the canyon? Rappel down a 100-foot waterfall. I have never been more focused. <laughs> okay, terrified. <laughs> than when rappelling down that waterfall. The roar of the water. The search for each slippery foothold. The burn of the rope in my hand as I held on way too tight. Yeah. But the coolest thing of all was the canyon itself. Giant ferns, hundreds of years old, clung to the canyon walls, walls that went almost straight up. Sometimes the vegetation was so thick that the sunlight barely made it to the canyon floor below. It was dark. And the sound? The sound was different, muted. It was like going back in time, a bit like Jurassic Park. You could easily imagine a wild creature just lurking around the corner. That same sense of adventure has led us to explore well beyond our home planet. Throughout the ages, we've looked at the night sky and wondered what is out there. And more recently, the exciting field of exobiology has emerged, life out there. What strange extraterrestrial life might exist in our solar system, not in a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> but nearby in our solar system, just around the corner in our slot canyon in this vast universe? What is the most extreme life form in our solar system? We are closer to these answers than ever before. Recent scientific discoveries from Mars, from Jupiter's moon Europa, and from everybody's favorite former planet, Pluto. <laughs> discoveries that shed light on what extreme life forms may exist out there. And of course, we need to look at our own home planet Earth to gain some insight about what it really means for a life form to be extreme. We have always been fascinated by the red planet Mars and the possibility of an advanced Martian civilization. Percival Lowell in the 19th century built an observatory in Arizona whose primary purpose was to search for Martians. <laughs> he saw these linear features, canals, and attributed them to an intelligent Martian civilization. It was really just an optical illusion, a trick of the mind caused by the low resolution of the telescopes at the time. Later, more powerful telescopes did not see these canals. And spacecraft that visited the red planet in the late 60s and 70s didn't see them either. But the spacecraft did see this. Imagine for a moment, it's 1976. You work at NASA's Mission Control. The Viking spacecraft is sending back this image. You would be the first person to see this. What would you think? <laughs> you might think, hey, that's a face on Mars. <laughs> At least that's the G-rated version of what you were thinking. <laughs> this image created all kinds of excitement. Many people thought it was evidence of an intelligent Martian civilization because, after all, a civilization with any smarts is going to build a shrine to a human face. <laughs> but with any scientific endeavor, we needed more data. Every time NASA or the Soviet Union or the European Space Agency planned a mission to Mars, they had to consider visiting the face on Mars. Many missions did, and in fact, here's an example from the European Space Agency's Mars Express in 2006. The face on Mars looks remarkably like a hill. <laughs> the human brain has this amazing ability to make connections. 
but sometimes we see patterns where they don't really exist. Here's an image taken by aircraft as it flew near Medicine Hat in Alberta, Canada. Obviously, it's a shrine to a human. This time, a Native American jam into his favorite music wearing earbuds. <laughs> in fact, it's a valley with a dirt road running down the middle leading to an oil well. So great Martian civilizations did not build canals or shrines to human faces. If there is life on Mars, if, it is probably in microbial form. The best analogy occurs here on Earth in the Atacama Desert in Chile, the driest place on Earth. Here microbes go in and out of hibernation based on the availability of water. This is in the salt flats of the Atacama Desert. Conditions on Mars are very similar. There are salt flats. These would be the prime locations to discover Martian colonies of microbes. <laughs> Perhaps a better place to find complex life would be at Jupiter's moon Europa. Water is a key ingredient for life, at least life as we know it, and that's what makes Europa so interesting. The, Jupiter, the moon of Jupiter is covered with water ice, carved with deep canals, deep, surface, deep uh, cracks in it. It looks a lot like a glacier, but underneath this glacier exists a deep liquid water ocean. There is more water on Europa than there is on Earth. Not only that, at the bottom of Europa's ocean is a rocky surface, active geothermally, caused by the strong gravitational pull, the tugging and squeezing of the giant planet Jupiter. Europa is not the only place that has a deep ocean. This is an image of Pluto, taken by the New Horizons spacecraft just last year as it flew by the planet dwarf planet. <laughs> Notice the heart-shaped region. Yes, Pluto, we love you too, even if you are a dwarf planet. Uh, this heart-shaped region is completely smooth, resurfaced by water and then refrozen. This water comes from below. You can think of this underground ocean as continually hydrating Pluto's lovely skin, because without it, Pluto would be a shriveled up, dry planet with deep wrinkles. We now believe that many icy bodies in the outer solar system have deep liquid water oceans. This raises intriguing possibilities about the search for extreme life. Why? Because at the bottom of our own ocean, near hydrothermal vents, near geothermally active areas, there exists this bizarre ecosystem that does not depend on sunlight for its energy. Rather, bacteria take normally toxic compounds and convert them into energy through a process called chemosynthesis, not photosynthesis. This serves as the base of the food chain for this thriving ecosystem. Giant tube worms, blind shrimp, because there's no sunlight, a ghostly octopus that drifts by. If we have this bizarre ecosystem at the bottom of our own ocean, imagine the possibilities at the bottom of Pluto's ocean or Europa's ocean. Now, no doubt that life would look dramatically different than what is at the bottom of our own ocean. And that would really be awesome to discover. But it's unlikely that this life is intelligent. We have visited these places. There is no evidence of a giant radio tower. And I'm pretty sure there's no Pokemon Go on Europa. <laughs> and then there are the tardigrades, the water bears. These are animals, not microbes about the size of the width of a human hair. You remember that slot canyon in Australia? 
it was likely teeming with water bears. In fact, if you go to a stream near your home and you run your fingers through the moss, you will likely have water bears underneath your fingernails. And they are virtually indestructible. You can boil them, you can freeze them, you can zap them with radiation. The European Space Agency has sent them on a rocket and exposed them to the vacuum and the intense radiation of outer space. And they survived. So if a water bear can survive the hazards of outer space, what does that, this mean about the possibility of a microbe or even a tiny animal hitching a ride on a comet and taking a tour of the solar system? Now, this would not be an intentional journey. This would be an accidental journey, not a smart, well-planned vacation. If you really want to see the most extreme life form in our solar system, you don't have to go to Mars or Europa or even a creek behind your home. You just need to look right beside you or in the reflection of your computer screen. <laughs> look very closely. That's right, you are a pretty extreme life form. Things that you consider normal for the overall scheme of the solar system are completely off the charts. Take this TEDx event, for example. Your brain is electric with activity. Billions of neurons are firing, making connections, storing information, thinking deeply, being extreme. Your brain is recording this moment, and this one, and this one, and this one. Hopefully you'll remember it a few, year, few hours from now. <laughs> or a few days, a few weeks, even a few years. Just think of the memory card that would be required for your video camera to store everything that you're learning today. And tomorrow. And the next. How are we able to have this intense brain activity? Well, for starters, our erect posture allows our pretty big cranium to be supported by our skeleton. Cows don't have the same advantage. Their head has to be supported by strong neck muscles. As a result, their head's not quite as big. Cows are just not that smart. <laughs> now let's not get too big-headed. We don't have the largest brain. The sperm whale easily wins that contest. We don't even have the largest relative brain size. A mouse, for example, has a larger brain relative to its body size. Now, don't get me wrong, our brains are pretty big, but the difference is the complexity of our brain. We have more neurons in our cerebral cortex than any other mammal. And these neurons are high quality. Think of them as monster cables in your brain that allow for great transmission and strong connections. Complex wiring. This complex wiring, this brain activity, allows us to do some great things. The pinnacle of human achievement, the pyramids of Giza, the rolling wheel, cookies and cream ice cream. <laughs> Things that you consider normal, a no-brainer, in fact, like vegging out in front of the TV, that would be an intense and demanding experience for any other species. Because during that no-brainer, your brain is still electric with activity. We remember the past and plan for the future. And we have the ability to change the surface of our Earth. The view of Earth from space looks dramatically different than it did just 100 years ago. A blink in geologic time. We have the capacity to change the world. But we have to be smart about it. In other words, we have to be extreme. 
Today we've learned that humans are capable of great things. Consciously deciding to pursue happiness. Consciously deciding to improve our health. Consciously deciding to go beyond ourselves, beyond our one square meter of space, to make the world more fair for everyone. And we are the only species to consciously, intentionally decide to explore beyond our home planet and leave it. While I do think that in our lifetimes we will discover extraterrestrial life, and what a historic and humbling day that will be. Most likely, it will be a microbe. <laughs> because if there were intelligent life capable of exploring other worlds, we would have already discovered it, or it would have discovered us. So as far as the rest of the solar system is concerned, we, humans, we are that wild creature lurking just around the corner. <laughs> we are the caretakers of the solar system. So let's be smart. Let's be extreme. Be the most extreme life form this solar system has ever seen. Thank you. <laughs>